Welcome to episode 42 of the Croydon Constitutionalist podcast, bringing classical liberalism to South London and beyond via our YouTube channel and wherever you get your podcasts. My name is Dan Heaton and my partner in podcasting today is Mike Swaddling, the co-founder of the Croydon Constitutionalist. Mike, how you doing? Yeah, good, Dan. Uh, having our, our Indian summer, which is rather nice, um, and uh, soaking up the weather, the world has been getting back to normal and then uh, then it was all changed. Uh, how are you doing? Yeah, not too bad. Yeah, you, the, things have been getting a bit more back to normal. Been in the office uh, every day this week in central London. So, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a bit more bit more like normal. Uh, it, it even had a shave every morning, which has uh, been very unusual for the past six months. Uh, well, I'm delighted that we can uh, welcome back to the podcast the Brexit Party candidate from Croydon Central at the last general election, Peter Sonex. Peter, welcome to the podcast. Uh, thank you very much indeed, Dan, and, and uh, hello, Mike, as well. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. How, you've, how have you been keeping over the uh, recent weeks? Well, I, I have to say the, these are strange times uh, indeed. Um, but if I can say about today, yes, uh, Mike mentioned the Indian summer. Uh, you're actually keeping me from a demonstration in Trafalgar Square, uh, Trafalgar Square today, uh, protesting against uh, masks uh, and the uh, restriction on our liberties. Uh, but I think that the 42nd edition of your podcast uh, trumps it today. Well, thank you very much for uh, for coming on. So, Mike, what are we going to be discussing today? So, uh, we're going to be talking about COVID and the, the latest change to rules. Uh, Brexit's been back in the news, and we'll be talking about that. Uh, BBC Pay uh, has come up again, and uh, some just our thoughts on that. Uh, and UKIP, UKIP have changed leader again, so we'll be uh, having a quick chat over that. Bringing the latest updates on Croydon Council and, and what's going on in our borough, and then giving Peter a chance to talk about the excellent Unlocked group that he's been involved in. Yes, the uh, COVID continues. Uh, the rules have been changing once again, not only in different parts of the country, but uh, but nationally. We're now allowed to meet in groups of six, I believe it is, the, the rule of six. Um, but it's all getting a bit confusing as to how many households can meet and where and when. Um, and now there have been some uh, local restrictions introduced in uh, various parts of the northeast, including making pubs close at 10 o'clock at night. Um, Mike, what have you made of the, the rule of six and, and, and the restrictions that are being brought in, in the northeast? Do, do you understand it all? I, I think... You can say, to be fair, one thing about the rule of six is it's very clear um, in, in the sense uh, that, you know, it, it's six. It, it's not, not terribly complex to understand. Granted, I, I do some archery and, and there's much many more than six of us. I know, I know someone that runs a judo club and they have more than six people and, and their kids do rugby and they have 30 people. And if you're in, I'm in a pub, I might be in there with, you know, 50 people. Um, but I do understand that if I'm walking down the street with, uh, you know, three friends and we see another three friends uh, or another, uh, sorry, there's four of us and we see three friends, under no circumstances are we to uh, stand next to each other or else the COVID marshals will be out to get us. Um, I, I imagine them to be a sort of a cross between Judge Dredd and Terminator. But uh, yeah, um, at, at least it, it's kind of understandable. Uh, but the main thing that's understandable is that it's just a, a, a colossal step back from from the positive moves we were making. It did appear that the economy had done less bad than than we feared. And, uh, you know, anyone who thought about investing in anything, why would you do it right now? Um, what's the reason for this? What's the evidence? Where's where's the increasing death rate? And, and what's the counterfactual? How are the countries that haven't locked down doing? And, and, you know, as I'm sure we're common to say, we, we know that Sweden's doing pretty well. They didn't have the same sort of lockdown. There hasn't been these massive spikes. 
there's a fear of something in the future. Is that is that a big enough reason to to close us down again? Yeah. So Peter, the, the, there's all of these concerns about a a second wave and and talk of how the the number of infections has gone up, particularly in certain parts of the country. But as as Mike says, the number of you know, hospitalizations, number of deaths, which ultimately you'd think would be the the important factor, um, doesn't seem to have gone up very much. Uh, what's your take on the uh, latest development? Yeah, it's it's almost as if we've got a, a government that's praying for a, a sharp increase in death, um, a sharp increase in hospitalizations, in order to allow their their narrative uh, to play out. Um, we, we're already seeing that the the rise in infections you know, is being blamed perhaps on on young people not following the rules. Uh, therefore, as Mike said, you know, the rule of six coming in. Uh, to, to keep it simpler, uh, but th this is a government that says that it, it's been relying on the science. Uh, so is, is it six? Uh, what's the evidence for five? What's, what's the evidence for, for seven, perhaps? Um, what's the evidence for indoors and out when we're led to believe from the outset of this that, that most of the infections uh, would take place in, in confined uh, spaces? So we have the rule of six, we have the simplicity of that, uh, but I, I really do fear uh, this uh, simplicity is more for compliance um, rather than effect. Uh, and, it, and it just seems extraordinary that in a, in a liberal democracy such as ours, uh, we're, we're uh, going down the road of telling citizens that, that they're not allowed to think for themselves anymore, anymore that, that uh, the government will do their thinking for them, their government will, will protect them, uh, and taking out of our hands our own uh, responsibilities. Uh, if you like to to manage our own risk look after ourselves and have a bit of compassion of course for those uh, who may be more vulnerable to this uh, and may require uh, much more care uh, in terms of, of protecting them uh, from a from a pretty nasty virus and that hasn't changed from the podcast that i joined with you back in april so we, we're no further forward other than the fact that we've got lots of citizens now who are really starting to understand this uh, and they're getting to grips with the numbers and they're starting to question uh, the numbers. Uh, sadly, I just don't see uh, our parliamentarians, our elected representatives, um, doing anything other than perhaps give Matt Hancock a bit of a hard time. But I think that hard time is really going to come in the next couple of weeks if, if this narrative that they're trying to construct uh, uh, doesn't actually happen. Uh, we can look at Sweden, we can look at uh, examples there, although I think we're, we're doing rather less well than Somalia at the moment. You, you raised a, a good point there, I think, Peter. You talked about, you know, it's one more thing. I, I, I see the government at the moment caught in this trap of believing if they just pull one more lever, make one more change, curfews of this, what possible reason is there for curfews? Does COVID tell the time? I mean, you know, they're just just nonsense idea but there's someone in government going oh if we turn the dial that way or, or a little bit the other way we can hit that magic formula that keeps everyone safe it's it's the kind of thinking that that is a command command economies communist countries you know fall under we can just make one more target for tractors and suddenly everything will fit into place and of course the roaring success of the soviet union north korea venezuela cuba um, uh, shows you that that's just not possible. They actually need to step back, take some decisive action in, in a few small areas. You know, for instance, not sending people uh, with COVID to care homes might have been one of those sort of pieces of action. Testing, they are, and you know, they have ramped up testing. You think um, at the beginning of this year, there was no such thing as COVID testing. We, we've got the capacity for half a million cases a day. I know there are problems, but, but that's quite amazing uh, that we've ramped that up. But, but this notion that they can control everything um, is is bonkers, and it's it's what's led to the downfall of of you know uh, the, the, what we grew up with has been the Soviet bloc, um, and then China saw the sense to move away from that, and, and they do control a lot, but but they opened up a lot. Yeah, well, How trust... the government's got caught in that trap, I I you know I don't know. Sure, and and if if government uh, loses uh, any more trust. Uh, then I think we, we, we could be in some really serious trouble uh, as the winter uh, unfolds. And, and of course, of course, a seasonal flu uh, has its uh, inevitable impact, um, uh, again, on, on largely on vulnerable people. Uh, that, that's tens of thousands every year. 
and we haven't locked down previously uh, to, to curb seasonal flu. We've had vaccination programs which have an effect uh, and it's quite difficult to quantify what that uh, effect is and how much it reduces uh, excess death and so on. Uh, but, but something that, that's come out over the last couple of days, Matt Hancock uh, said that um, the, the false positive rate on the, the PCR testing that they're doing is only 1%. Uh, now, I'm not a mathematician and I've always advocated uh, that in schools we should really do a lot more on probability and statistics, uh, not only to help students, but to perhaps uh, help staff as well understand what a false positive rate of 1% is. Um, but if that's uh, 1 in 100, if it's 10 in 1,000, but we're only looking for relatively small numbers per 1,000. We're looking for relatively small numbers per 100,000 even to try and gauge where this uh, particular uh, a pandemic may be going, but a 1% um, uh, false positive, uh, or a 1 in 100, uh, uh, 10 in 1,000, uh, 100 in, 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 in 100,000, that, that's a lot, of, a lot of people coming up with positive tests who don't have the disease uh, at all, and yet lockdowns are being predicated on uh, an increase of 10 or 15 in 100,000 uh, residents, and we now have 13.5 million people in in a more severe version of the lockdown. Uh, given now, uh, Dan, that you know the northwest is now included in this, parts of Lancashire um, and, and the Wirral are now now in this um, increased uh, lockdown. Uh, very very worrying. Uh, and if I can go on to another one, uh, Tobias Elwood, the chair of the Defence Select Committee. Uh, when they were quizzing um, Boris Johnson on his COVID uh, response, he offered the use of the armed forces. Uh, now, he offered the use of the armed forces strategic planning, its communication capability, its command and control capabilities. And, and that worried me a lot because what he didn't mention was what the military uh, was extremely good at at the beginning of this pandemic, which was in their engineering and logistic capability, the ability to put those Nightingale hospitals up uh, very, very quickly, and to point out, the Chief of Defence Staff pointing out, that he really hadn't seen such inefficiency uh, within an organisation uh, like the NHS and even within government previously, that he, he was really quite uh, dejected. Uh, by the performance that he saw and how much inter he had to intervene in, in just some, some very basic uh, project management, uh, let alone anything more complicated. So what is uh, Tobias Elwood offering? Uh, he's offering, uh, is it compliance and policing? Are we going to see something like the situation in Victoria in, in uh, uh, Southern Australia where the, the police are going out on joint patrols with the police to ensure uh, compliance and, and curfew. Uh, that's not military aid to the civil community as we know it. Military aid to the civil community is how the Nightingale uh, hospitals were built. Uh, what Tobias Elwood is offering, it would appear, is military aid to the civil power. Uh, and that is concerning because the, uh, the biggest example we've got in recent history of military aid to the civil power is in Northern Ireland. And I don't think any of us uh, would like to see uh, any return to the, 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 the bad days of the trouble in Northern Ireland where the uh, armed forces are being used uh, in military aid uh, to the civil power in, in policing somewhere. So some, some warning signs here that people perhaps, um, and, and conservatives uh, uh, more so perhaps than other, others, needing to be reminded of the fact that, that we are in a liberal democracy uh, Mike listed um, uh, everywhere uh, that, that, that uh, you, you could say was definitely illiberal um, on, on the, uh, the, the communist side of things. But you've got people like Tobias Elwood who, who are advocating military intervention. That's really very worrying. You don't want to sort of read people's thoughts, I, you know, and I, and I wouldn't pretend to do that. But I have to say my impression when I saw to, Tobias uh, Elwood in the, that, that meeting my impression with Matt Hancock a few times now is they're almost salivating when they announce the next lockdown or <laughs> offer up the, the the people. There's there's no reticence uh, perceived at all. It's it's a functionary response of you know we can do this, we can do more, um, and that's a very worrying place to see senior politicians. 
yeah, I'd agree. It's as if they, you know, Peter, you mentioned you're not a mathematician and then you talk about some, um, some figures there in terms of um, infection rate. It's as if people don't understand or the, the government uh, politicians don't understand the concept of risk. You know, just because there's an illness out there doesn't mean you'll get it. And even if you get it now, what is the risk of people being hospitalized or, or dying from it? And it's pretty, pretty slim because, you know, ultimately the, the, the disease came here in the, the, the early part of the year and, and it, you know, it killed off the low hanging fruit. But maybe the politicians are, whether they, they understand it or they don't understand it themselves, they're treating the, the citizens as, as children. Yeah. You know, they're not prepared to be honest with them and say, look, this condition is going to be around for a bit. And some people will unfortunately die from it as the, uh, as the winter comes on. Yeah. It's not a question of a second spike. It's just that people's immune systems will be lower. And, and as happens every year with, with seasonal flu, some people will, will unfortunately uh, catch it and will probably, probably die from it. And we're probably not it's doing... the infantilizing of the citizens in the, in the way they're saying you can only, you know, uh, the, the really, really frightening people potentially say you know obviously there's the potential there for tr troops on the street or whether whether it's troops or whether it's these these covid marshals you know like um sort of reminds me of when i was a kid and i was in the playground and there'd be you know teachers telling you to go and stand over there or, or what have you um it, it's just like to me it's just infantilizing the uh, the citizenry yeah i think we've got ourselves in a situation now and i, and I think it's um 30 it could even be 40 years worth through our education systems, through the civil service, through our institutions, through our churches, that the precautionary principle has come to the fore over risk assessment. Um, the precautionary principle that says, let's do something just in case. Let, let's do something because better safe than sorry. Uh, but business doesn't work like that. The private sector doesn't work like that. It looks at risk. It looks at the likelihood of something happening, the consequence of it, multiplying those two things together, taking away some mitigation, and then looking to see if that risk, the residual risk, uh, is acceptable uh, or not. It, it strikes me as incredible that, uh, again, if we're not going to teach probability and statistics at school, that we're not teaching some sport, some part of, of risk assessment so that people can can go into their adult lives uh, with a, a an empirical view of risk and what might be acceptable what resource do you need to mitigate against risk uh, can you tolerate it uh, if you haven't got enough resource can you transfer it to somebody else this is nothing new this this is um, you know what, what every project uh, management course in the country uh, every mba uh, course will teach people, but we just lost all of the empirical reasoning that goes with risk in favor of the precautionary principle, just in case, better safe than sorry. And I'm afraid that there is no such thing as COVID safe. There, there is no such thing as a safe space, a safe environment. And the, soon, the sooner we get to appreciate that as a country, um, start using our reasoning skills, uh, we, we really are just going to be in, in such a pickle. There is no end state there is there are no conditions that we can see that can be met that will allow us to get out of this uh, the government has gone all in on a world-class uh, test trace uh, and isolate system the, the the government's going all in on a vaccine on the understanding that the only way out of this is for those those two conditions to be met. Well, the, the, the testing is not definitive and the vaccine, likewise, whenever it comes in, is unlikely uh, to be definitive. We're not going to be able to treat COVID-19 in absolute terms. There is going to be residual risk. The sooner we understand that, I think the, the better. And, and I think the, the citizens of this country uh, may just be waking up to the fact that the, the narrative they're being sold it is not necessarily in their best interest. Well, whilst we're uh, potentially being put into a, a second lockdown, uh, that hasn't stopped the uh, the dinghies coming over from uh, France, full of people who are uh, being put up at the taxpayers' expense. And um, we don't know who they are. We don't know what uh, 
what uh, what illnesses they may be bringing uh, or anything else for that matter. Um, Peter, what should we do about these dinghies? Well, I, I think we're we're starting to perhaps see this being rephrased. Um, uh, though those of you who have been part of, of UKIP. Um, uh, uh, me coming late to this party uh, with the Brexit party last year. Uh, as soon as you mention the word uh, migrant or uh, illegal migrant, uh, you, you, are, uh, you risk automatically being put into a, a xenophobe um, uh, category. You automatically risk being far right wing. You automatically risk uh, being an Islamophobe. Uh, and where is your compassion uh, for these people who are in desperate straits um, uh, even to the point where they'll get in a dinghy uh, to, to, to come across the English Channel. And if anybody's paddled around in a canoe uh, in our coastal waters, you'll know uh, just how hazardous uh, that is. But, but we're seeing mainstream media pick up on it. We're seeing um, perhaps rephrasing this into people who are attempting a legal entry into the United Kingdom. Uh, let, let's try not to use the emotive word, perhaps, to say, well, it, it's a legal entry. What are we doing about it? And we have a government that, that is very fixed on the minutiae of the detail when it comes to COVID-19, uh, down to, to every single test uh, day by day, uh, every single hospitalization, uh, death and so on. When it comes to uh, illegal entry into the United Kingdom, uh, how many? How many by boat? Uh, how many by truck um, or, or by other means? Uh, large boats, not, not just the small ones. Uh, of those, uh, how many are intercepted and are in the system being processed, either for uh, asylum cases uh, or to be judged uh, perhaps uh, as illegal immigrants and, and sent back uh, to where they came from? Uh, how, how many people are involved in this? Uh, and I, perhaps you know, scariest of all, bearing in mind that the first duty of government is to protect us all, is how many of the people landing, not just in the small boats, but, but uh, the back of trucks, how many of these people are at large in our communities? And then just to put the human uh, piece onto this, the, these people are not necessarily criminals. They're not necessarily here to do us harm, although we can't rule that out. But these people are being, in the main, I would say exploited, they're being exploited by people traffickers uh, for whom uh, these individuals are a commodity. And, and I think we need to really wake up to the fact that the uh, commoditization of people uh, is, is a particularly nasty part of all of this, where, where the traffickers uh, through North Africa, across the Mediterranean, or from the Middle East, uh, across through Turkey uh, and, and uh, up through the Balkans and so on, these people are being exploited, trafficked, moved, and in some cases they don't even know uh, where they're going. Uh, it, it's a big industry, there's a lot of money uh, wrapped up in it. Um, a, a dinghy with an outboard motor isn't cheap, uh, let alone uh, uh, finding somebody prepared uh, to, to buy one in France. That can't be too easy these days, can it, surely? Uh, and, and, and gather the resources to launch that dinghy uh, into uh, the, the English Channel. So there's a huge human part to this, but I think there's a, a political will that's not being exercised by our government. Now, that's unusual, isn't it, in these days, to hear that a lack of political will, uh, to do something about it and actually to protect these people um, who are being exploited. Uh, it saddens me that what may change this um, will not be government action, that's either the French government or the United Kingdom government. But what may change this is the weather. So the crossings become unviable, not because we have a clandestine um, uh, crossings uh, ex-Royal Marine commando uh, as, as the coxswain on a, on a fast patrol boat, but because of the weather. The weather will have the biggest single impact on stopping that particular route, but won't stop the trucks uh, and the larger uh, vessels. And it may uh, take a tragedy at sea, more than one tragedy at sea, to, to suddenly wake people up uh, to what is going on uh, in our coastal waters. Uh, a tragedy is not really uh, the thing that we should be uh, looking for in terms of uh, waking people up to a problem of illegal entry into the UK. There's, there's a question of truths here to me. Uh, you know, whether you want more immigration or less immigration, whether you think you should have more asylum 
places or less and, and, and how we think, however you think we should handle them. Can we not all agree that people should arrive here at a port uh, via an immigration system, not on a dinghy via a criminal gang? Can we not all agree that? You know, and, and the truth is the vast majority of the British people can agree that. The vast majority of, of both the government and the opposition, I don't think, can seem to agree that. Or, and indeed our media can't seem to agree that. Um, it, it's other truths, you know, we, we do want people uh, who, who are in genuine fleeing in fear of their lives to be able to come in via the asylum system. Can we not all agree that France, you know, as much as I might like to take the mickey out of France as a good Englishman, it's a pretty cracking country, let's be honest. Can we not all agree that France is not a terribly dangerous place that people need to flee from in fear? Um, you know, and, and maybe we should help France because they've had a certain number of asylum seekers. Then let's come up with a system to, to do that. Let's have a, some standards, some truth around what we're doing. Not, not you know, let France have a camp on on our on the you know the northern coast of their country because they know so many people just escaped to Britain one way or another. This there isn't. There's no standards. There's no truth. And and much like if we talked about with COVID, there's a the government, and and I I mean that in the widest sense, not necessarily just the people currently in power, although it is them as well, uh, are treating us for fools. You know, we're we are surrounded by a moat. Uh, we have a big navy, um, and we can't seem to stop these dinghies, and we don't seem to have any uh, desire to stop these dinghies. We do have a desire to stop more than six people getting together, law-abiding British citizens, taxpayers. Uh, we we do have a desire now in certain parts of the country to make sure you're home and tucked up in bed by 10 p.m. Um, you know, we but we don't have a desire to stop people illegally entering the country. There's a level of contempt in that. I, I, I just, you know, I feel that, and, and kind of maybe I've always felt that, but I think more and more people across the country are going to feel that. And that moves us to, to really quite a dangerous place. Mm. We, we've got a government, government that's being very nice about this. Um, uh, we've got a Home Secretary in Priti Patel uh, who, who has uh, spoken a lot about this, but we're, we're not really seeing uh, much action. Uh, we're hearing that uh, Dublin 3 uh, and other um, uh, international treaties may, may be tying uh, the government's hands uh, until perhaps the 31st uh, of December. But again, they're not being truthful about that. What, what are the real reasons that they're not taking action? Uh, and we know that, that um, these things can be changed. Uh, we, we don't have to accept uh, the status quo or accept a situation uh, where uh, something has changed. Uh, that, that Dublin 3 did not necessarily anticipate 5,000 people in small boats uh, coming across uh, the channel with all the challenges that that, that may bring. Uh, and also uh, a little bit of truth, perhaps, even though Chris Philp uh, will head across uh, to, to Paris and speak with counterparts, uh, we're still not seeing action. We're seeing, seeing uh, fine words, but not action. And some truth, perhaps, in in uh, what I perceive to be, and I'll use the phrase advisedly, uh, because our own government uh, has got into trouble with this, particularly Theresa May, uh, through the word, uh, through use of the word hostile environment. Uh, there, there is no question in my mind that in France and Spain uh, and Greece and Italy, there is a hostile environment, um, and, and therefore uh, people who are being exploited, are being trafficked, are being sent towards Europe, uh, and paying cash for it uh, are finding themselves in a hostile environment and the one country that does not have a hostile environment uh, and, and, and that is quite right is the United Kingdom. We remain compassionate, uh, we, we remain uh, uh, humane in, in our, our treatment of people who are less fortunate than ourselves uh, but that really does mean that the spotlight is on us uh, and increasingly we become uh, the focal point uh, the destination of choice for people doing this. Uh, the very thing that Australia had to grapple with, uh, with, with uh, boat people and so on, uh, making the relatively short crossings from Papua New Guinea uh, or, or even putting their lives at risk in, in the, uh, the Pacific Ocean to try and reach Australia because they knew that, that Australia uh, offered uh, many more opportunities for them. So I think you, you're absolutely right, Mike. So, some truth in this, some honesty in this, some debate uh, on this, uh, in, in Parliament uh, and elsewhere, 
that 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 brings the essence of this to the fore. Um, that doesn't write people off as, as xenophobes and Islamophobes. Um, uh, we, we're not callous. Uh, we we do need an immigration system, the much vaunted point system, and so on. But that point system is, is useless if people can circumvent it uh, so easily. Well, moving on to uh, one of our regular topics on the podcast and the uh, developments in, in the Brexit negotiations over the past week or so. Uh, Peter, you mentioned uh, an international treaty there, it's the uh, Dublin Three, I think, I think it's called. Um, and it's all been an argument this week about whether or not a particular act of parliament that the, or, or a bill that's been put forward by the government will be in breach of international law. Uh, the government has introduced a bill that's called the Internal Market Act, and it seems to have been brought in as a result of a threat or a perceived threat that the EU may in fact ban or in some other way impede goods travelling from Great Britain to Northern Ireland in the event of a WTO Brexit and the Northern Ireland Protocol kicking in. When questioned on this, uh, Brandon Lewis said that we would be that, that, that the, the, the bill, and he said the bill at the time, would uh, breach international law in a specific and limited way. Well, that was it. There's been all kinds of shenanigans in Parliament, even some uh, alleged Brexiteers have been kicking off on this, uh, as it is a suggesting that uh, the UK government proposing to break international law was some sort of you know huge outrage and um, mike what have you uh, made of the shenanigans over the last week it's it's been the usual you know remain and leave kind of groupings together on this by and large i know that there have been some brexiteers show some outrage but you know this international law thing and and, and dan you you're you're a lawyer by trade um can you or um, can you just tell me when it is I can vote for someone to get who will change this international law? You know, what election is it that I get to vote for that the person that brought this law in or kick them out or someone that's going to change it? And if you can't tell me that, I couldn't be less interested in it. You know, if Maybe. it's not democratically accountable to me as a citizen of this country or you know, and citizens of other countries, for that matter, if it's an international law affecting them, I couldn't care less about it. Um, and, and, you know, we had our act of democracy, it was to leave the EU. The withdrawal agreement, and, and granted our parliament, and for, you know, lots of reasons that, you know, too many to go back to, uh, to uh, eventually signed this god-awful deal with the EU, and the government's you know, unlike on <laughs> what we've just been talking about, has shown some courage and said, no, actually, you don't get to push us around anymore. We're going to take back sovereignty on this, or at least has the option to take back sovereignty on this. Well, yeah, that's what I'm interested in. If I don't like what they're doing, I get to vote them out in a few years' time. Um, this international law, I don't get to vote someone out, then as far as I'm concerned, it has no control over my life or, or the life of the, the country I'm in whatsoever. You mentioned, you know, international law. When do you get to vote for the people who pass international law, etc.? Et um, there's been huge confusion within the government this week as to whether, as to what, what exactly the breaching in international law um, is. It the actual, the actual bill itself? Does the bill breach international law? Um, so therefore, the government has already breached that in, that international law. Or is it if it goes if it passes through Parliament, or is it specific clauses within the law if they are subsequently invoked? And of course, it's the the last of those <laughs> options, um, w which it would be. Um, but even then, it's already arguable that the EU is in breach of uh, various clauses within the withdrawal agreement itself because it has. Uh, not acted in good faith in terms of negotiating a, a free trade agreement. And that's a counter argument that's being put forward that the, the withdrawal agreement can already be argued to be null and void because the EU have already breached it. 
So if they've breached it, it, do, it no longer exists. But then you've got the bigger question of which you sort of raise, which is really does international law exist? And the answer is no. It's, it's a political concept, really. Um, it, we've had Tony Blair, along with his mate, John Major, Major. Yeah. Arguing, the, uh, arg arguing about this and that uh, you know, the government is uh, behaving in an outrageous way. As we all know, Tony Blair breached international law um, by taking us uh, into, uh, into the Iraq war but he has not been prosecuted. And that goes to show that ultimately international law is a, is a concept, but it doesn't, it's not really a, a practical thing because there isn't really in, in most cases, possibly with the, the only thing I would say is possibly um, uh, genocide. You could say that genocide is, uh, a thing where some people, once they've eventually lost power uh, or lost a war, uh, they have been prosecuted for genocide. That's probably the only real, I would say, concrete international law. But let's be honest, as I said, they have to lose, they have to lose a war or lose power before they're ever actually brought to trial for, uh, for, for those, you know, those genuine um, you know, crimes against humanity, that, that you don't get brought to that, to, to those courts for uh, breaching a, a clause in a treaty. Um, so, yeah, but the, the, the government's been very confused about the messaging on this. I, I heard um, Rhys Mogg on the uh, Conservative Home podcast earlier in the week saying that it was important for Brandon Lewis to say that to, to, to acknowledge in the House of Commons and therefore in the record of Hansard that the government was, you know, the government knew that the clauses would potentially breach international law. So that in future, when that law is being interpreted by a judge, if somebody tries to take the, the UK government to court in the UK, that the judge will be able to look at the law, see what it says there in black and white, and then look at the interpretation of that law and see what it said in Hansard. So there would be no argument whatsoever as to what it said and what the government meant it to say. So that was one argument. But of course, it seems now that there's, there's going to be a compromise. It seems that the, the rebellion has, uh, has uh, sort of faded away a little bit because it looks as if the, the act is going to get through at least the Commons, and we'll, we'll see what happens in the Lords, albeit with a, an amendment going in, which means that if the offending clauses are to be invoked by the, the government, uh, that will have to be a vote in the, in the House of Commons, you know, a, a meaningful vote, no doubt. Um, so that's where we are from a, a legal perspective. But... Uh, I've always thought that it's a, a bit of a strange one, this, because ultimately, if the EU were to, to, were to say, you know, the basically banning goods going from Great Britain to Northern Ireland, and, and the, there's a few ways they could do that, but basically the one way is to, is to not put the United Kingdom on an approved list of exporters. Um, and of course, it would be ridiculous then for um, people from one part, you know, exports from one part of, the UK not being able to go to another part of the UK because they're not on the uh, approved exporters or importers list from a, a, a non, you know, a, th a third party altogether. But if they were to do that, how on earth do they think the EU would be able to enforce that? It they is. don't have a Navy. They, they couldn't physically do it. They could say again, and it's this issue you mentioned about the law. What is, international law and indeed no law is any you know, laws aren't really any good uh, there's a there's a whole ray, ray, range of reasons for why they they might not be good but one one rule is you know one the concept is you can't have a good law if you can't enforce it and there's no way the eu could physically enforce you know a, a banning on on um on, on ferries going from scotland or you know um container ships going from Scotland to Northern Ireland or, or vice versa, they couldn't physically do it. So it's, it's a bit of a, it's a bit of a strange one. This it's a, it's a bit of one for um, the, the lawyers, I think, um, worrying about these things because in practice they wouldn't be able to do it. 
But like you said, Mike, it's good to see the uh, the government having some backbone at least in terms of uh, dot, you know looking to dot the i's and cross the t's from their own perspective to give themselves the power to be able to to basically overrule the with the withdrawal agreement. Um, now, Peter, I think did did you serve in in Northern Ireland? I, I served in Northern Ireland under what was called Operation Helvetica, which was um, the operation in the twenty first century. Uh, post the the Good Friday uh, Agreement, uh, and obviously ramping down dramatically uh, the uh, the military presence uh, in in Northern Ireland. Uh, but my own corps, uh, my own corps of Royal Engineers, uh, still has, and this isn't specific to Northern Ireland, it still has a United Kingdom wide role, military aid to the civil power, which I mentioned earlier, and that is to do with uh, high assurance and high risk search. Uh, this is a legacy of the uh, Grand Hotel bombing in Brighton, where the Thatcher uh, government was very nearly wiped out uh, by an IRA bomb. So my own core, because we're uh, made up of artisans, um, bricklayers, plum plumbers and pipe fitters, uh, painters and finishers, uh, and so on, we, we can look at a building, we can uh, see an environment and, and spot anomalies. So it's about anomaly detection. So my uh, role in Northern Ireland, mostly uh, with technology, uh, is to provide military aid to the civil power uh, for that very specific high assurance, high risk search capability, which the police forces don't have. It, it's not something uh, that a police force could generate uh, from within itself uh, because they're not electricians. Uh, they're not uh, carpenters and joiners. Uh, they, they cannot uh, necessarily spot uh, the anomalies that we could. So that's my Northern Ireland piece. Um, we, we've had the, uh, the intervention um, uh, in, in this uh, from uh, the United States of America. Uh, and no surprise, really, uh, that we should have an intervention uh, from the United States Democratic Party. Uh, famously, uh, they, they've been um, uh, unionist in, in uh, sorry, I mean, they, they've been nationalist in, in their leaning. Uh, that, that won't surprise anybody. But I, I lived in the United States for three years. I served in the United States Army uh, for, for three years. Uh, and I found a lot of that uh, was in ignorance of the, the nuance that there is uh, on the island of Ireland. Uh, just what does it mean to be a, a nationalist? What does it mean uh, to be a, a unionist uh, over there? Uh, and I have to say that the United States uh, Republicans, uh, likewise, uh, many in ignorance, uh, will, will uh, uh, perhaps even, even preach a, a nationalist cause. They'll stand up for the Irish. Uh, and, and not realize that, that that is something that may be uh, counter to the Good Friday Agreement, uh, counter to the position uh, that uh, is now uh, in an international treaty through the Good Friday Agreement, a bilateral uh, treaty uh, between uh, the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland. Nothing to do with the EU, uh, was not brokered by the United States. Uh, the United States are not guarantors uh, of that particular uh, bilateral uh, agreement, uh, although you, you might think uh, that, that they had masses uh, to do with it. Uh, you'll recall it was a Canadian who was actually doing most of the legwork uh, between uh, the uh, paramilitaries on the nationalist and, and the unionist uh, side. Not a lot of nuance and understanding, I regret, uh, in many of those in the United States. Uh, a quick anecdote, if you'll allow me, you know, was edited out is that I was uh, invited by the West Point Association to march in the St. Patrick's Day Parade with them, join them uh, on the uh, St. Patrick's Day Parade in Savannah, uh, in Georgia, uh, outside Boston and New York. It, it's, it's one of the, the largest um, uh, expatriate Irish communities. And uh, I, had to, I declined as politely as I possibly could. They didn't understand it. They, they thought that, you know, I, I would clearly have some sort of um, uh, feeling for, for uh, St. Patrick's Day and, uh, and a, a pint of Guinness and, and so on. I, I had to point out to them that, that it would be uh, no place for me in Savannah, Georgia, to be marching behind the Sinn Féin float, uh, wearing a British Army uh, uniform, and uh, where the route includes uh, marching past uh, the Kevin Barry pub uh, on River Street. Um, uh, for those of you not familiar with Kevin Barry, uh, Wikipedia uh, will point you very quickly to the fact that he was a teenager uh, who, who was executed in Dublin Castle um, uh, during the Easter Uprising. So th th there are 
elements there that, that are still naive in their understanding and the, the idea that there is nuance in the relationship that the United Kingdom has uh, with the Republic of Ireland uh, means that we do get um, the, these uh, pronouncements uh, from the United States. But I have to say uh, of all of them, uh, the, one, uh, the ones from uh, Joe Biden and from uh, Nancy Pelosi are, are perhaps the least helpful. It just sounds to me like virtue signaling to, to shore up the what they perceive as the Irish vote, which I assume they think, you know, should be the vote in the same way that Joe Biden believes he's entitled to the vote of, of every uh, African-American. And um, but, yeah, you say about the, the nuances in the in the relationship. Of course, the uh, the only people who are actually talking about doing anything which would actually breach the, the Good Friday Agreement uh, are the EU. Because if they want, if they look to put up any sort of any sort of borders at all, and they say they're not going to do that, but they also say that they want to protect the single market, and and they're failing at the moment to uh, to to agree to a, a sensible free trade agreement, it would actually be the EU that's the, the nearest uh, body to actually breaching the Good Friday Agreement. Although, as you say, again, they don't actually they're not actually party to that agreement. So it would really be the EU making the Republic of Ireland breach the Good Friday Agreement, I suppose. But anyway. And, and that, that let's, let's you know, uh, hope it doesn't happen. Uh, another element to this is, is that the, the withdrawal agreement um, that the Brexit Party was, was advocating uh, for getting rid of it uh, right from its earliest inceptions as part of uh, Theresa May's plan uh, part of, of that checkers meeting uh, where the, uh, the then uh, foreign secretary resigned uh, and became ultimately our prime minister. So the, the withdrawal agreement has, has not been a, a popular element within the, the Brexit party. We've, we've been uh, trying to highlight uh, from the moment it came out, from the moment that it was recycled uh, by Boris Johnson, that it was a really bad idea. Uh, there were elements in, in that 500 and odd page document uh, which to yeah, practically every element in that was, was, was something that was not in the United Kingdom's interest. There were tentacles that would mean a, a EU uh, influence, even EU jurisdiction uh, over what was supposed to become under Article 50, that, that withdrawal process, uh, that we were supposed to come out of that um, a two-year process with a transition uh, to becoming a, a, a sovereign uh, independent, self-governing uh, coastal nation state again. Uh, that just hasn't been recognized either by the EU or our own government has failed to recognize that withdrawal agreement uh, is not helpful uh, in that regard. Uh, the government had a chance to do something about this pickle. We know how the withdrawal agreement came about. It was, a, uh, in my mind, a constitutional crisis in the, the summer and autumn of last year with, uh, let me use the, the phrase advisedly, a Remainer parliament. How do you get through this stalemate in a constitutional crisis? Well, one way to do it is to, to, to get a bill through, which although it is flawed, uh, at least allows the process to move forward. I get that. What I don't get is that uh, we have a Conservative Party manifesto on which uh, they were elected, uh, it goes back to what Mike was saying earlier about, you know, how, how can I influence international law? Well, you, you can influence it uh, because any international law to be effective in the United Kingdom has to be incorporated in our domestic law. So the withdrawal agreement, um, Boris told us, we're taking back, uh, get Brexit done. That was the phrase, taking back uh, control of our law, our money, our borders, uh, our, our fishing uh, in absolute terms, sovereign terms, no, no further interference from the European Union, despite the fact that the withdrawal agreement uh, contains tentacles that still bind us uh, into agreements on some of those things, compromises, if you like, in our sovereignty. The government, having got its 80-seat majority on the 13th of December, what could it have done? Well, it, it could have said, ah, we've had a constitutional crisis. The withdrawal agreement was a useful vehicle to, to get us to this point, but our manifesto pledges trump it. We are going to repeal the uh, withdrawal uh, bill, the withdrawal act. But far from doing that, 
uh, in, in uh, late January. It went before Parliament uh, virtually unchanged and, and was passed into uh, the, the canon of uh, the laws of this land. Uh, Article 4 uh, in that bill binds us uh, to the European Union and decisions that can only be uh, affected by agreement with the European Union. Uh, that is not sovereignty, that is not taking back of our, our, our laws, uh, our borders, uh, and our money, uh, and our fish. So a constitutional crisis that led us to the withdrawal agreement could have been undone between uh, the 13th of December and uh, into January uh, when it passed into uh, our own laws, 23rd of January. That political will, for some reason, was not there. Has the government then been trying to build a case whereby it can prove that the European Union has not been acting in good faith uh, throughout this process? It's not enacted Article 50 in the way that it should be. That Article 50 should see us after a two-year period with a transition, leaving with our constitutional requirements intact. Uh, those constitutional requirements, we, we don't have a constitution, Mike and Dan, I might want to ask the constitutionalists, the Croydon constitutionalists, about uh, the usefulness of a constitution. But what we do have are the Acts of Union from 1707 onwards. Uh, they are the closest that we get to an Act of Union. And yet, we allowed a withdrawal agreement and a political declaration to effectively uh, ride over those Acts of Union that are enshrined in our domestic law and lead us to a situation whereby Northern Ireland can be annexed by a foreign power and whereby uh, movement of our own people, our own goods, our own services between the mainland of Great Britain and uh, Northern Ireland uh, could be influenced by a foreign power, uh, perhaps even in perpetuity. That, that's not acceptable. And we have now, I sincerely hope, uh, to see a, a government uh, exercise some pretty strong political will, repeal the withdrawal, um, uh, the bill that, that brought in uh, the Withdrawal Act uh, on the, the 23rd of January, and, and stop tinkering with it. As I say, there's nothing in those 500 odd pages that is remotely in the United Kingdom's interest. It's in the United Kingdom's interest, in my opinion, to uh, not uh, come work alongside the EU, but to diverge uh, from uh, that uh, ghastly uh, anti-democratic uh, institution. You, Peter, you mentioned there uh, just briefly uh, the Brexit Party's view on it. And and this will from the government, let's be honest, has, has been uh, enhanced or helped uh, by intervention from Nigel Farage again. Um, this week. I don't know if you were ready to uh, start campaigning or, or indeed stand against one of the uh, Tory rebels, but I thought uh, it was a well-timed intervention from the Brexit party, which, you know, hard, hard to say kind of what, uh, how much the Brexit party fully exists at the moment, but um, it, it certainly felt like it helped uh, see down a potential rebellion on the bill. Yeah, the Brexit party still exists. Um, I, I uh, as one of you know, still 38,000 odd um, supporters of the Brexit party and as a, a candidate last year in, in uh, Croydon Central. I said at the time that I would um, hold this uh, government to account. I would hold them to their word on delivering Brexit. And uh, I stand by that. Uh, late last week with the internal markets bill uh, being formed, with it heading towards second reading, and with the threat that, remember, uh, that the, the Parliamentary Conservative Party is still 55% um, Remainer uh, in its leaning, in that it, it's voted, uh, voted for the uh, withdrawal um, uh, agreement first time round, the Theresa May um, uh, uh, treaty first time round. And, and there is still uh, a, a block within the Parliamentary Conservative Party that I think is, is unhelpful. And what Nigel did, and we got warning of it um, in the middle of the, the previous week, that should there be um, a, a number of uh, Conservative Party members not voting uh, with the government, that we would today, this, this Saturday, 
uh, be in those constituencies uh, campaigning against those individuals for breaching their trust, for not keeping to their word uh, and holding them to account. I don't know how much influence that had, uh, but there were just the two um, uh, conservative parliamentary conservative party members who voted against the government, uh, a raft of others uh, who abstained, didn't vote, uh, forgot to vote, um, didn't um, uh, nominate a proxy. Let, let's give them the benefit of the doubt on that. But, but one thing we shouldn't do is, is doubt our resolve that as this bill progresses through the House of Lords, and you know that the Brexit party has got a, a lot to say uh, about the, the House of Frauds, as we'll sometimes term it, term it uh, for effect, uh, that, that as this bill progresses, uh, we will ramp up again and we will again um, uh, highlight the hypocrisy of Conservative Party um, parliamentary, uh, Conservative Party members who stood on one platform uh, in up to the general election in uh, last year and are now again back into their mode of frustrating the will of the people and indeed uh, frustrating the, the will of the government, I hope, in seeing Brexit through, seeing it done properly and not some awful Brexit in name only. We're still here. We're still holding people to account. We still want them to keep to their word. Excellent. Well, that's, uh, that's great to hear. Well, uh, one chap who's uh, never been elected to the, the House of Commons, but nonetheless, we have to pay for and... Uh, he uh, he takes our takes our our money and he uh, gives us his uh, his political opinions via the Twitter. Is uh, is Gary Lineker, and uh, but Gary's uh, Gary's wages have been announced this week. Although he's graciously going to be taking a pay cut, apparently. Um, Mike, what would you do with uh, you know a measly what was it one point seven five million pounds a year? I you know the. It, it's sometimes in life, and, and I've certainly been there, you, you find yourself moving money between different accounts and, and paying different bills to certain uh, uh, amounts of different bills so you can just kind of make it to the next paycheck. And, and you, you're, you're giving an impression of more money than you've really got. Um, the phrase robbing Peter to pay Paul springs to mind. And I, I sympathise with uh, Gary here that, you know, he's going to have to find himself with a staggering pay cut you know, wondering is it the, the, the gas or the council tax, is it the water rates or the lecky bill that he's got to pay next week? Um, it, it's quite tin ear to think that you can announce a 25% pay cut as a, as a kind of positive thing when it's still in the millions and you're starting to charge the over 75s for, for TV licenses. The, at, at the same time, you've lost quarter of a million people have ceased paying the, the TV license in the in the last return and I, I count myself as one of them um, you know it is quite quite amazing how they they thought that 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 would sound uh, good in any way just looking further down the, the list though there's something that really struck me with it is I'm looking at the list of people paid over more than the Prime Minister at an amount we, we've used for various things uh, here in Croydon and there's, there's names I don't know. Um, ben Brown, Clive Meyer. Uh, it might it might be, you know, reflecting on me that I don't know who they are. Um, maybe, I'm sure they're very famous. You know, Sophie Rayworth. Um, I couldn't couldn't spot them in a crowd. Um, uh, and then there's some names I do know, but um, you know, Claudia Winkleman is, is, you know, I sort of. You know, I know know who she is. Seven hundred twenty nine thousand. I don't know what she does. Um, it's not it's not in any way come across to me. Vanessa Feltz. I mean, I thought she used to be very famous. Is she still worth four hundred thousand pounds? And you know, there's a whole load of those sort of names that you wonder. Um, it, it's not just the headline figures. It's, it seems to be all the way down the organisation. There's there's a, 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 a frankly a spending frenzy. Well, one of those things you refer to as spending frenzy is that uh, I understand Zoe Ball, who uh, apparently presents a program on uh, on Radio Two, um, but of course is is most famous for being the the daughter of uh, of Johnny Ball. Um, despite losing a million listeners in the past year while she's been presenting said program, uh, she's had the best part of a million pound pay rise apparently. So. Um, 
yeah, the, the BBC is not really cutting its, uh, its cloth accordingly. Um, and of course, Mike, you, you, you wouldn't know any of those people because you don't watch or you don't watch the BBC because you don't watch television. That's why you don't have a television license. I, I, I certainly don't watch live TV. So, yes, you're, you're absolutely right. Absolutely. Uh, Peter, what have you made of these, uh, these revelations this week? Well, the, the numbers are, are really quite staggering um, when you, you think that uh, Gary Lineker's pay you know, takes 42,000 uh, pensioners to, to cover uh, that salary. It, it is, uh, you know, quite frankly, uh, obscene. Um, a number of the people that you, you mentioned, Mike, I mean, their, their talent, their on-screen talent uh, is for reading aloud um, to camera. That, that's that's what we're paying them for. Uh, there might be quite a lot of stuff they might do uh, behind the scenes in, in terms of putting their words onto the auto queue, but, but that's the limit of the talent. They've won a lottery. Uh, they, they've won a, a selection, uh, uh, the prize in a selection process that, that allows them to reach those, those heights. Uh, but I think it also distorts the market um, ra rather badly. Uh, you, you'll, you'll know that uh, the independent uh, media, uh, you know, they don't have to publish their um, their salaries. They're, they're not uh, public servants. They're not civil servants. Uh, and they're not held to account uh, other than to their, their owners, their shareholders, and so on. Uh, but I can assure you they, they will not be paid the, the eye-watering uh, sums of money uh, that the BBC are getting. Um, and, and, and it's had a, a disproportionate effect on the market, uh, inflating uh, what uh, on-screen talent uh, may uh, so-called earn. I, I think it's just a, they've won the lottery uh, in, in, in uh, uh, applying for those posts and, and getting it uh, with, with pretty stiff competition. And that's not surprising uh, with the sums of money that they're offering. Uh, could they uh, provide services, uh, limit those services and actually be a genuine uh, public service broadcaster that, that informs, uh, educates and entertains? Uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, one of the reasons, Mike, you don't know uh, some of these names is that uh, a lot of them are involved in, in radio. Uh, they're involved in, in a plethora of, of television channels, uh, all churning out content, uh, a lot of it pretty niche, uh, some of it with, with very small uh, listening numbers uh, at all, uh, and, and some of them in, in, in radio, local radio, and so on. It, it's the classic uh, quango where not just the on-screen talent, but the, the civil servants working in, in uh, the Department for uh, Culture, uh, Media and Sport. It's an outlet for them to get to the big money. Start off in Whitehall, uh, start off on, on a, a civil servant's salary, make your, up, your way up through the grades, and the goal is to get yourself into a quango uh, where the, the really big money is. is uh, get yourself into local government uh, where the, the big money is. Uh, and I, I'm sure that uh, Joan Greeny can tell us uh, about her uh, career path uh, that led her to a £400,000 payoff uh, out of uh, Croydon. Uh, and indeed, Catherine Kurzweil, I'm sure, will have a, a background um, in, in uh, uh, central and local government. Uh, and, and she's just won the lottery. Yeah, so you, you mentioned the Peter, uh, Joe Negrini and uh, Catherine Kurzweil. Um, obviously, shenanigans have been going on in, uh, in Croydon Council recently and they're facing potential bankruptcy. Um, Mike, have we got an, an update on what's going on there? Well, P Peter's already mentioned this here, the, the uh, rumoured payoff, and, and we've seen it reported in a few places now, um, for Joe Negrini of, of over 400000 That's you know, a huge sum of money, um, uh, more than it would cost to reopen a uh, pearly swimming pool, which is not reopening. And, and uh, more than it would, I, I suspect that would go an awfully long way to opening up a number of the borough's libraries that are not open. So if I look down the list here, um, Bradmore Green, which is up in Old Causton, is closed. Broad Green is closed. New Addington is closed. Now, Norbury's closed for a renovation, so that might be, a, a you know, quite a reasonable thing. Purley's closed, along with the swimming pool. The council seems to have abandoned Purley. Do they not pay tax like the rest of the borough? Apparently not, not, to, the, not to the like of Croydon Council. Sandersted, Shirley, South Norwood and Upper Norwood are all closed. Um, you know, these are services we pay for. Um, and, and the profligate, um, uh, appalling way in which uh, Negrini and Newman have 
squandered our taxes has, has led to this cut in services. But, you know, libraries and swimming pools are important. We're going to see cuts in children's services. We're going to see a uh, real blight for families um, as a result of what they've done. And, and it's just worth just reminding them there, uh, you know, Croydon's in, in a lot of pain. Um, they still seem to be playing around with low traffic areas. I, I, it's not my thing. It may be very good for some people very useful but but when you've got no money maybe stop spending um and and hopefully and, and as, as peace has mentioned hopefully uh um catherine Kurzweil will come in and do something about that she's the uh new chief executive at croydon council um just you know someone needs to get a grip of their spending i have to say i i do look at their their spending schedules when they publish them uh, for amounts over 500 They've either got better at hiding stuff or they have genuinely stopped, stopped spending so much money in bad ways. But it wasn't just spending, they weren't efficient. We saw that during the COVID crisis, the early part of the COVID crisis where they couldn't get grants paid out. Um, but there's a, there's a lack of leadership. And this is what it comes down to. There's, you know, the Croydon's, uh, uh, there's, there's real problems in our borough. They're not getting sorted, the money's gone. And I'm not sure how we move out of it at the moment because I don't think anyone feels that uh, the current council's got the will to uh, to make some changes there. No, we wish the uh, the new interim chief executive well. You uh, you mentioned there, Micah, there's been a lack of leadership with Croydon Council, which uh, moves us very nicely on to uh, to UKIP, where there's been a plethora of leaders uh, over recent years. Uh, since Nigel Farage stood down after the 2016 referendum victory, effectively, um, it looks like we're now on to the, the 12th leader of UKIP in that time. Admittedly, that's if you include interim leaders, uh, one of whom was uh, Nigel Farage himself, uh, briefly. Um, Mike, what on earth has been going on with uh, UKIP just this week? Well, as those of us that know, uh, it, it's a, we, we need to be slightly careful because there may be legal action around this, but um, Freddie Vatcher, who was the uh, elected leader, now I, I, was, I say elected, I'm not sure anyone else stood, but, but ran for leadership and became the, the leader of UKIP uh, a little over 82 days ago. Um, Freddie had been a long time member. He was the chair of London UKIP. Um, uh, he was an incredibly eccentric and weird bloke, but he would do stuff. And, and you know, um, unlike uh, perhaps their previous couple of leaders and interim leaders, and, and one one of whom, Paul um, Warchop, I hadn't heard, oh, sorry, Paul Piers Warchop, I, I, I hadn't heard of him. And I'd been a member of the party not long before that. Um, you know, no idea who he was, no idea who he is now. Um, you know, Freddie, Freddie would have an impact. Uh, we, Dan and I are, are on various email lists. I'm not, not sure we asked to be, but, um, uh, you know, we got this, this funny email about a week or so ago saying um, Freddie didn't have access to, to UKIP accounts and maybe the, the party had been hacked. Well, it hadn't been hacked. It turns out that the National Executive Committee had decided to remove Freddie and appoint uh, Neil Ham Hamilton. So, um not not really sure why that is. I don't think we've really heard any any reasoning behind that. We've heard rumour, but but no no absolute reason as to why that's happened. Um, and yeah, once again, a party that and and Peter, you know, you, coming from the Brexit Party, you mentioned a large number of supporters there. Um, what the Brexit Party lacks that UKIP even now probably still has to some extent is members and and it's uh, local support bases local organizations bank accounts um a, a person who has the table a person who has the uh, you know who has keeps all the leaflets whatever it might be a local structure that's really important um and that's just all been squandered over the last few years it's it's a real pity that uh, particularly right now when we could do with the party fighting for liberty they've uh, sort of thrown it away again yeah, you, you've got a, a situation with uh, what I'll call the, the you know the non-establishment parties. We we've got um, obviously uh, the Labour and Conservative parties uh, very well established, and it's very difficult to see uh, how 
one of the non-establishment parties can, can break through uh, into that. Uh, we, we've seen the, the challenges within UKIP, and I have no, no background in UKIP at all, but it's almost as if um, the, the parties on the edge uh, with the structures um, generate their own factions, they, they generate their, their own fiefdoms uh, that go with that local party organization, which appears on the face of it to be something that you might want, uh, and that's how the establishment parties work. Uh, and yet we're, we're seeing that the meltdown uh, within UKIP perhaps, and the, the meltdown a couple of weeks ago uh, with the, the, the National Committee of the Libertarian Party uh, going a bit public in their own uh, challenges. Uh, the Brexit party hasn't gone down that road yet. It may. We've certainly discussed it. How, how do we build uh, local support? Uh, in building local support, uh, does that simply lead us into all the challenges that exist uh, with, with establishment parties? Uh, and we're not necessarily uh, an establishment organization in many respects where we're, we're anti-establishment uh, there may be uh, another way uh, of tackling this uh, and i've certainly been working with brexit party colleagues to, to look at the the traditional models and, and determine whether or not those those traditional models are, are of benefit bearing in mind of course that the brexit party has had uh, what i would say uh, you know, blowing our own trumpet uh, remarkable success in terms of influence uh, if not uh, success other than in the uh, European Parliament elections uh, as a black swan, uh, that, that we've not had success in terms of parliamentary seats. Um, but is the traditional model, the one that UKIP and uh, libertarian parties have, have hung their hats on, uh, is that the way to go or, or is it ultimately uh, self-destructive? And I think there's something there. The way the establishment parties and, and even smaller establishment parties or established parties um, um, keep keep their their party together is by being able to offer opportunity. Um, you know, the, the Lib Dems have a, a few MPs, but a huge number of councillors. Green Party has a lot of councillors. To be fair, at one point UKIP had a lot of councillors, and UKIP was at that point manageable. And I do think there's something here where if you don't think being part of the party gives you an opportunity of advancement, um, you you see personal interests overrun uh, party interests um, and, and you get that factionalization you're less likely to split if you know that the council seat you're running in or, or indeed may already have uh, it, it requires you to be part of that organization and requires you to work with others um, and I, I don't know how you get around that you almost need to become a semi-established party overnight um, and clearly that's a, a pretty tall order to achieve although although with the may local elections uh, next year being a, a, a two years in one um you know maybe maybe there is an opportunity that hadn't existed before yeah i suppose in terms of ukip and then sort of later on as well the the, the brexit party which is as you've mentioned is a, a completely different model um it is useful to have an actual cause that uh, that you can broadly all all agree on even if um, even if you don't get on with certain people, you can at least campaign for the cause. And perhaps with uh, with UKIP having lost its main cause, whether that be you know after having won the referendum, or whether it be particularly after the Brexit Party was then you know created um, last year in particular. Although UKIP had gone downhill by then, but once the Brexit Party effectively took over as you know the number one brexit supporting party um what else is what else is left really for uh, for ukip at the moment i'm, I'm not sure that, that there's anything left really um well peter you mentioned the um the different ways that parties can be formed and, and how effective or not they can be in uh, in campaigning uh, you're involved with a, a a group the uh, the unlocked group uh, would you like to tell the listeners a little bit about it yeah, sure um unlocked uh, is a, a subset, I think I can use that word, uh, of this uh, non-traditional, uh, non-establishment, non-established party view. Uh, Unlocked uh, is uh, fronted up by uh, ex-members uh, of the European Parliament, uh, Brexit Party members of the European Parliament, with a, a media uh, savvy background, uh, people who are involved in social media, 
um, uh, particularly with regard to Twitter, uh, Facebook, uh, YouTube, and are now uh, able uh, to use Unlocked uh, coming out of the, uh, the, the lockdown of the country and the economy and having a view on that, uh, having a view on British industry uh, that's coming to the fore. Uh, the, the good news that mainstream media is not sharing with us uh, the fact that even with the lockdown, even with the recession, uh, our exports to non-EU countries has gone up by 14%. Our exports to the EU 27 have gone down by just over 1%. That's not a lot. It's still gone down, uh, but it's the, the great news that even with the recession, uh, we can uh, uh, really start doing great things with the opportunity we've been given on the world stage. So unlocking the economy is one aspect of it and telling the good news that our mainstream media uh, hasn't. Uh, they're all a bit dour, uh, and I don't know why. Uh, the other part of Unlocked, of course, is, is making sure that Brexit uh, is delivered, uh, and it's a, a media for making sure that the government remains to be held to account. It's a, a media to make sure that they're held to their word. Uh, it also has some things to say about COVID itself. Uh, again, just getting the, the figures out, the numbers out that, that make you question just what is the government narrative uh, and where might it be going. And in the same way as, as Unlocked is a, a subset of uh, the Brexit party, uh, you've got Brexit Watch. Likewise, uh, Brexit Watch uh, it provides um, web-based material. It, it provides uh, articles, documents that, that show the direction of travel uh, for the government as it uh, stands with Brexit. It has the Brexit barometer, for instance. It has a, a barometer which tells you, a, a, a gives a score for the government on rhetoric. It gives the, the government a, a score on action. Uh, it won't surprise you to know that the, the government's currently got six out of 10 uh, on uh, rhetoric, and it's got zero out of 10 uh, on action. Uh, and it really needs to ramp up the political will uh, if we're to see that Brexit barometer uh, change at any time soon. Uh, the other subset, uh, a supported subset of this, um, and I know we're not necessarily going to, to discuss this uh, today, but that is uh, the aspect of don't divide us, that um, as a, a nation that celebrates it, its diversity, uh, that has a, a great track record with a few um, uh, major uh, 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 elements in that that haven't gone well in terms of how we've handled, uh, for instance, uh, the, the Windrush generation uh, and others, but how with a history that is full of the ups and downs of, of, of any uh, country on the planet, actually we've come out of the other side of that, able to hold our heads up high with how we've united and not divided uh, and how uh, there are forces that may be acting now uh, with regard to, to division uh, rather than unity. Uh, and we're trying to counter that narrative as well. So there are subsets of the Brexit party uh, through uh, media channels, uh, through Unlocked, through uh, the World Wide Web and documentation through Brexit Watch, and indeed just making sure that, that we try and uh, keep a hold of the, um, the unhelpful narrative on, on division uh, along uh, racial and other grounds, uh, which, are, which are not helpful for our country. So subsets of, and I think they're taking the lead, uh, uh, Mike and Dan, from, from your own uh, Croydon Constitutionalist podcasts. Um, um, it's very, uh, very good to hear. Now, it, it sounds like a, a great initiative. Uh, how can people get involved? Uh, they can get involved by following uh, the, the usual um, uh, aspects of, and, and I hope that the team uh, there with the Croydon Constitutionalist may just include uh, some of the links to, to Unlocked, uh, perhaps even to, to Brexit Watch and Don't Divide Us. Uh, links to their, their Twitter accounts, their, their Facebook accounts, uh, and the YouTube channels. Uh, and it, it's striking me that, that uh, with every day that goes past, the mainstream media is, is starting to lose the plot. Where is the truth? Where is the wisdom? Uh, where can I find information that, that isn't simply supportive of uh, uh, an increasingly uh, fragile uh, government narrative? Where can they go for something that, is, of course, is going to be biased perhaps in the other direction, but at least it's a, a something that people can look at and inform themselves and make up their own minds. Uh, let, let's have uh, not necessarily diversity uh, along strictly uh, racial grounds, 
which may be unhelpful, but let's have absolutely some diversity of thought. That sounds great. And we'll definitely put the, uh, the links in the, uh, in the description so people can, uh, can check that out. Thank you. Well, Mike, uh, we obviously have a website and we've got a, an interesting piece on the website uh, that's gone up recently. Uh, Peter alluded to it earlier. It's regarding the, uh, the Libertarian Party. Yes, for those that don't know, the Libertarian Party, who we've done a lot of work with, um, have uh, unfortunately had a bit of a meltdown in the uh, National Committee and, and a number of people have left. So there's a statement by eight former members um, of that committee we've published on our website. It's published in other places as well. Um, they, they've put that out and said, yeah, you know, let, let people know uh, about events there. Worth, worth a read if you're interested in the Libertarian Party. Also worth maybe following up with some of them. So, so certainly we've, we've had Sean Finch involved in a number of things we've done and Dan Lidicott involved. Um, they are, are making next moves in terms of uh, actions on liberty and, and they are thinking about what they can do next. I don't think anything's come out yet, so I don't really want to say anything, but, but follow them um, and, and, and see what they're doing. Uh, there's definitely a lot of people who feel particularly under the current COVID restrictions, we, we need to take a stand and uh, it will be good to see what they do next if unfortunately not via the, the vehicle of the Libertarian Party anymore. Yeah, no, it makes, a, makes an interesting read. Well, if you'd like to write for the website or have any stories you'd like us to cover, please do contact us. You can do so via the Twitter at Croydon Const, via our Facebook page, via our website, croydonconstitutionalist.uk, or via email, croydonconstitutionalist at gmail.com. We'll do please subscribe to the podcast and the pubcast and to our YouTube channel. Do please like, share and do please leave a review. We always like feedback and it helps others to find the podcast. Well, thank you, Peter, for joining us today. It's been a pleasure as always. Thank you. Pleasure's mine. Thank you for inviting me again. And thank you to everybody else for listening. Until next time, it's goodbye from me. And it's goodbye from me. Stay safe, everybody. 